It was a sunny Saturday morning on June 23, 2018 in the quiet Baltimore suburb of Rosedale when the doorbell camera of 62-year-old Cindy Testerman's quaint cottage clicked on. The footage showed a man strolling casually up the front walkway around 9.50 a.m. Cindy's smiling face soon appeared as she swung open the door to greet him. Their muffled, cheerful exchange could be briefly made out before Cindy welcomed the man inside. Just over 24 hours later, a far more horrifying scene would unfold within that peaceful cottage. Cindy's son, Robert, decided to swing by his mother's house that Sunday afternoon, concerned by her lack of communication. Robert spoke to his mother nearly every day, so her uncharacteristic silence had felt off. As Robert hesitantly stepped through the front door, an ominous feeling washed over him, and there was a strange smell in the air he couldn't quite place. As he walked further inside, the scene unfolding froze him in his tracks. There was his beloved mother lying crumpled on the kitchen floor, blood surrounding her battered body from multiple visible wounds. He instantly recognized the unmistakable emptiness of death. As he tried to make sense of the scene before him, his eye caught something equally alarming. His mother's 12-gauge shotgun sitting inexplicably atop the kitchen table. Past the table, the scene looked violently disrupted. Drawers stood emptied out, contents dumped in chaos. A doorway to the left revealed more disorder in the living room beyond. Furniture in disarray, cabinets emptied with items strewn across the floor. It was clear that foul play was involved. Look at everything you been on and recorded. She's inside, straight ahead to the right. I, ha I haven't even gone into the kitchen yet. Distance that I was away from her, it looked like it was red around the neck. Within minutes, first responders had flooded the scene and confirmed Robert's greatest fear. His mother was dead. Detectives surveying the area took note of the blood-stained kitchen floor and walls, clear signs of a violent struggle. Cindy's body displayed multiple wounds concentrated around her head, neck, and chest, which investigators suspected had been inflicted by a bladed weapon used with extreme force. Equally disturbing was the state of disorder in Cindy's home. Cash and other valuables appeared stolen, and her 2013 Honda Accord was conspicuously absent from the driveway. As detectives began canvassing Cindy's shaken neighborhood looking for any witnesses, they sat down with her grieving son to comb through footage from Cindy's home doorbell camera. Looking at the home security system. Um, so if we go back to, that's yesterday, so Friday, I can see her coming home. That's my mom. So I can see her coming home. The video held disturbing revelations. They spotted an unknown man making contact with Cindy during the days leading up to the murder. It was clear that they knew each other, yet Cindy's son Robert had no idea who this man was. As investigators went door to door, desperately seeking anyone who might shed light on Cindy's demise, they encountered unsettling revelations surrounding her neighbor and friend, Judy Slesback, who resided across the street. The man spotted on camera entering Cindy's home shortly before her murder was revealed to be none other than Judy's 32-year-old stepson, Ryan McGuire. He was a relative mystery to many neighbors in the area, and they didn't know much about him, besides the fact that Judy had taken him under her roof after he lived a rather erratic existence, drifting between homelessness, petty crime, and a long-time addiction to substances. Perhaps the aging Judy hoped that she could nurture the damaged boy behind the volatile addiction, but it seemed that proximity proved too tempting. Before long, Judy had apparently developed her own pain medication dependency issues, and her wayward stepson proved more than willing to fuel her habits because when Judy was under the influence, he could manipulate her into feeding his own addiction as well. As police probed deeper and deeper, even more chilling revelations came to light. Investigators alarmingly found out that no one had seen or heard from Judy for at least two months. Her car hadn't moved, gardens lay untended, Calls and visits found no response. Though Judy was reclusive by nature, neighbors agreed that such a vanishing felt unnatural. When they inquired where Judy was, Ryan explained away her absence with claims that she'd been admitted to an intensive rehab program out of state. But police couldn't help but wonder if there was more to the story. Detectives decided to investigate, so they walked across the road and went to knock on Judy's front door, hoping that Ryan could provide some answers. But despite the detective's loud knocks and calls through the locked front door, no stir of movement or response emerged from inside the home. 
As they peered through the windows, they saw that the house was ominously dark and there were no signs of occupation. Bins weren't emptied, and letters in the mailbox were untouched. It was clear that no one had been home for quite some time. With Judy's puzzling disappearance combined now with the brutal murder of her friend and neighbor, Cindy Testerman, police immediately started fearing the worst. They secured an urgent warrant to enter and search Judy's property for answers. Police search warrant. Okay. I'm with you, I'm with you. Police search warrant. As they entered Judy's home, an ominous quiet greeted law enforcement. The first floor revealed little besides signs of weeks old abandonment, dust coated surfaces while flies gathered in corners. As they entered Judy's bedroom, they found cigarette butts overflowing multiple ashtrays and prescription bottles littered every surface. It was clear that her bedroom appeared to be lived in right up until whenever she vanished. As they continued their search trying to locate Ryan's room, they were met with a magnetic unease. All the other rooms sat equally empty and there was no sign of Ryan or any of his belongings. They realized that Ryan had hastily left the home, but with no evidence of foul play, it seemed that their investigation had hit a brick wall, and they knew that in order to move the case forward, they needed to locate Ryan McGuire. An intense manhunt immediately kicked into high gear, as authorities urgently sought to track down McGuire. Police fanned out and visited known places where Ryan was known to hang out. They circulated flyers and Ryan's photos to local businesses, warning he was wanted for questioning regarding a homicide investigation. Yet despite their best efforts, police were still no closer to finding Ryan. The first big break would eventually come when Cindy's grieving son, Robert Testerman, provided a critical tip. He logged into his mother's banking profile and realized that her bank cards were still being used at locations around Baltimore. Police then cross-referenced these purchases with surveillance footage from these businesses, and there they saw their prime suspect, Ryan McGuire, withdrawing cash at a local drive through ATM before using some of the cash at a local store to purchase cigarettes. Police also noticed that the card was used at a motel in the area. Undercover cops immediately set out and surrounded the motel, staking out and carefully documenting all vehicles coming and going from the property. Nearly two tense days passed with no activity, and investigators worried that Ryan may have already fled, once more eluding their frustrated grasp. They finally caught a break when they spotted Ryan arriving at the motel and entering one of the rooms. Officers immediately pounced and arrested him without incident. A quick search of his room uncovered his illicit spending spree remnants, liquor bottles, drug paraphernalia, women's jewelry, and critically, the actual stolen credit card used at nearby stores in the name of murder victim Cindy Testerman. The damning evidence removed any lingering doubts and Ryan McGuire was brought in for intense questioning. Hey, how's it going? Anything around here? Yeah, probably. Um, I'll have to find one. We might take a minute, but yeah, I don't think that's a problem. Are you, are you good? Did we get the wrong thing? Good. I ate one. Oh, okay. Um, anything else? Anything you need? I feel like cigarettes. You give me a cigarette right now. I'll tell you everything y'all need to know. Okay. What was all that about? I'm not, uh, I'm drugs. And I you use drugs? Yeah. Are you uh, under the influence of anything right now? No. Okay. I have nothing to do. Okay. Um. Well, you said you've been staying at the, at the motel there? Yeah, I, I stayed there for a couple of days. Okay. What about before that? Um, I can with that lady. Who's that? The loose car I had. And Judy. Yeah. Okay. What's your relationship to her? She's like, I don't know, step mom or something like that. Okay. Um, she lets you use the car and everything. Yeah. All right, nice lady. Um, where where is she at these days? Yeah, hey, listen. I need a cigarette. I'm not saying nothing else. I get a cigarette. Okay. I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know. She's gone too. She's dead too. Just to let you know, she's dead too. You gone charging with that one too. So I'll tell you where she's at. Seems like a cigarette. All right. What about that? It's a, no, like people smoking in here. So, allegedly suck up the. Y'all not gonna find Judy without me telling you where she's at. Where's she at? She's throwing her out. Okay. 
Do y'all think they're actually where it's at? All right. Can you explain it to me? You know, she got high. She was getting high, so she asked me to shoot her up. I shot up with GOD. So I had a warrant. I wasn't going to call the police. Ryan McGuire then told police that he had kept Judy's body in a wooden cabinet in his room before revealing the precise location of her makeshift wooden tomb. Police went to search the property once more, and they finally found the decayed remains of Judy Slebzak. Forensic evidence in the days following would further seal McGuire's guilt. The credit card receipts and blood DNA found on his shoes firmly tied him to both scenes. He admitted to police that his intention all along was to end Judy's life solely so he could indefinitely continue living in her home and using her money and vehicle without interference. He also calmly confessed to slaughtering Cindy Testerman weeks later, specifically because she had asked too many questions about Judy's absence. Ryan McGuire was promptly charged with two grisly counts of premeditated first-degree murder. In November of 2019, Ryan McGuire ultimately pleaded guilty to both first-degree murder charges. By then, even his own defense counsel acknowledged that any fading embers of humanity left in him had long since frozen over in the icy grip of narcissism and nihilism. Showing little emotion, Ryan McGuire stood impassively to receive his all but inevitable sentence. The judge ultimately sentenced him to two full consecutive life terms behind bars without the possibility of parole.